This program is made possible by a grant from the Kugelman Foundation. This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Bill Harrell and welcome to Inside Healthcare. Our topic tonight is preventive medicine. In the United States, there's more emphasis on treating disease than preventing it. But the fact is, after 40% of the deaths in the U.S. are the result of one way or another of unhealthy behaviors. Smoking, obesity, lack of exercise, uncontrolled stress, poor diet, high blood pressure, all of these things contribute to premature death. And what is the impact of this neglect on individual health and the health care system? And is prevention the answer? We'll answer those questions tonight at this town hall meeting located at the Gene and Paul Amos Performance Studio on the campus of Pensacola Junior College. Stay with us as we explore the benefits of preventive medicine and the services available in our area. Well, joining us tonight, we've got a great group of people with us tonight. Uh, with us is Butch Branch. He's the Life Center Coordinator. PJC Milton Campus. Welcome, Butch. Thanks, Bill. Glad to be here. Also with us is Dr. John Lanza. He's the director of the Scambia County Health Department. Welcome, Dr. Lanza. Thank you. Also joining us, Patsy Malley. She's an instructor at the University of West Florida. Yeah. Also with us is Dr. Terry Neal, the medical director for the Sacred Heart Regional Stroke Center. Welcome, Dr. Neal. Thanks. And also with us is Dr. Lonnie Paulos, the medical director of the Andrews Paulos Research and Education Institute. Welcome, Bill. Dr. Paulos. Also joining us is Dr. Tom Snyder. He's the medical director of the Florida Health Span Institute. And welcome, Dr. Snyder. Hi, Bill. Thanks. And finally with us is Dr. Steve Willis. He's a family medicine physician with Florida, West Florida Primary Care. And welcome, Dr. Willis. Hi. Thanks. Well, goodness gracious, it's a big, big topic, uh, preventive medicine. And Dr. Willis, I'm going to let you have a crack at trying to define it. Since you're on the front lines every day as primary care physician, how would you describe um, preventive medicine? Well, that's exactly right. You know, in primary care, in family practice, internal medicine, pediatrics, this is something we deal with on a daily basis and is a very important part of our practice. There are two approaches you can have in medicine. You can either wait until disease happens and then react to that. You can treat someone with high blood pressure. You can have surgery on someone with a tumor that has to be removed. or you can take the preventative approach. You can try to screen for diseases before they become a problem. You can do some testing and studies to pick up problems um, that may arise in the future. And you can recommend lifestyle changes, diet and exercise that can prevent problems altogether. Well, Dr. Willis, let's, um, I know when a new patient comes into your office, they have to fill out the forms. And, and one of them has to do with a family history. And let's say you're, you're looking at that form after it's been filled out and um, somebody's um, grandmother died of a heart attack when she was 57 years old, and you're kind of looking at that. And then you're also looking at the fact that um, this uh, woman had a sister who died of breast cancer when she was 47 years old. But the uh, mother and father have done real well. They've lived into their 80s. But there's also a uh, uncle that died of colon cancer. Now, what, what do you do at that point? Do you all of a sudden look at that patient a little bit different, saying that there's certain things we're going to have to really key in on this patient? And, and how would you do that with a family history? Yeah, absolutely. You know, more and more we're finding diseases that run through the family, diseases that are genetically stimulated or predisposed by your genetic basis. And so we're always on the lookout for things that primary relatives, first degree relatives, your parents, your grandparents have had and that clues us into extra testing that needs to be done. Colon cancer is a great example. If you have a parent or a brother or a sister who had colon cancer, we need to test you earlier. You know, if you had a father that had prostate cancer, you're somebody that might need a blood test for PSA, the, the prostate cancer screening blood test a little bit earlier than someone else. You know, now we're finding more and more about the genetic basis of breast cancers and there are certain cancers that are uh, highly predisposed in certain people that have a genetic background and so we're now able to do genetic testing to tell us this lady may be at very very high risk for breast cancer in the future let's react now before it gets too late. We certainly had a little blow up recently when um, I guess a governmental agency recommended um, that breast cancer 
screening not start until later on? Well, and, uh, you know, when you look at uh, kind of coming up with uh, when you should start certain tests and all that, how do you uh, judge when you should as a primary care physician? You know, that was a great example of, of ways that our society, our community, our local community needs to really be on the watch out for the government involvement in medication and in medicine in general. Uh, all it took was seeing a couple of ladies stand up and say, look, if we had followed those new guidelines that administrators, not doctors, were coming up with, I wouldn't be alive today. You know, if they had put my breast, my mammogram screening off for a year or two, they would have picked up my cancer so late, I wouldn't be here today. So there's always a balance. You know, we have pretty good general guidelines on at what age we should test for what disease in certain patients. And it's like we said before, there are certain factors that may make you screen earlier. There are certain uh, differences based on race or sex or family history that we pay attention to. And so you've got to use the guidelines that we've developed over the years. And the guidelines are always being tweaked and there's always a little bit of leeway. There's nothing set in stone saying that I need to do a prostate blood test in a man when he's 50. Some men I might have to do it when they're 45. But over the years, as we've gotten better and better at preventing disease and predicting disease, we're getting a better handle on what age that really needs to kick in. And even though there's a little bit of cost associated with it, it's all about, you know, you may have to spend a little bit of money now to save money in the long run. You may have to do some testing now to prevent illness and death in the future. Thank you, Dr. Willis. Um, Dr. Lanza, um, what is the role of the health department in this large landscape of, of prevention? You know, what, what is y'all's mission and what are you trying to achieve as far as prevention? Pretty broad question, but I know you can handle it. Well, there, there are three different types of prevention, and the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak, is in primary prevention. Um, we get out there to try to prevent uh, diseases from occurring to begin with rather than treating them um, somewhere along the line. So I, I'm, I'm involved with prevention for the overall population that gets down to the person level, patient to pa uh, doctor to patient level, but we're interested in putting up billboards, for example, which as a hospital, a doctor's office wouldn't put up a billboard and talk about mercury issues or talk about how to prevent drowning issues, these sort of things. So public health is out there looking at the big picture, trying to um, prevent the, and I disagree with you a little bit, I, I think 60 to 80 percent of diseases are lifestyle related uh, okay. diseases. Okay, well, hey, disagree. Uh, but only 90, <laughs> only 3 percent of the I mean, the people do dollar, bad things, right, to their bodies. And only 3 percent of the health care dollar goes to uh, public health and prevention, uh, th that message. So, well, we've got uh, our first question are. from somebody in the audience tonight. They didn't want to put their name, but they, uh, here's the question. Anonymous? Mm. Ah, yeah. <laughs> we hear a lot that it's recommended to drink a lot of water. Is tap water in this community safe to drink and in large quantities? Uh, and they could give a pretty large amount a day. All right, so is that something the health department does, uh, keep up with uh, the quality of the water in our area? No, that's a DEP responsibility and EPA responsibility. Okay. So we do monitor uh, private wells, though. We do look for uh, bacteria in, in private wells and make those kind of recommendations, but we don't do uh, community water systems. All right, this one's easier. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, recommended uh, vaccinations. That's something. Hot you're, topic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Something your your department uh, does. Yes, and, we do. We and, do that. Uh, it, it's a great program been in, been in existence for a long time a lot of people go to the health department to get those um, those recommended vaccinations um, uh, is this really the beginning of prevention in, in a person's life the, these vaccinations from say birth to uh, maybe five or six well about 10 or 15 years ago the CDC declared vaccinations as one of the top 10 public health achievements of the last century along with healthier foods uh, a better hygiene and the recognition that cigarettes are extremely hazardous to one's health. Vaccinations have since Jenner first started doing them 260 years ago for smallpox way back when, have saved literally millions of children's and adults <coughs> lives from diseases that are now because of the vaccination totally preventable. Um, we only have to, to pop on an airplane, go down to Haiti, and see where vaccine preventable, preventable diseases are killing children on a daily basis. There, the vaccine rate is about 40% in some places in the cities, whereas here, the average vaccine rate in the United States is about 85% of, of children. 
Um, vaccines uh, lead to something that we call herd immunity, which protects the overall population, even if some people are not vaccinated within that community. But the more people that are not vaccinated decreases the ability of the whole population to protect itself from, from vaccines. So that's what we're, some of the issues that we're interested in in public health. And certainly, you know, controversy around certain vaccinations and things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, they're recommended, most pediatricians say go ahead and do it. 99.9% .9 of pediatricians recommend uh, children um, get their uh, vaccines, uh, preventable disease vaccine. Um, and of course, your age. background is in pediatrics. Yes, so I'm a board certified pediatrician. Right. Well, I wanted to talk about um, a real concern in our society, and that's obesity levels in the U.S. And we're starting to see childhood obesity being just a, just a major problem. And I had a chance to visit with uh, Karen Capps to find out what's being done in the Scambia County schools. And we're going to roll a tape now and take a little bit of, you know, look at what's going on sure. in the school system, but also what's being done at a special school in our area. So let's, let's roll that tape right now. The data has shown over the past few years that at least a third of our children are either overweight or obese. So if you're above the 85th percentile for BMI, you're considered at risk or overweight. And then if you're above the 95th percentile, you're considered to be obese. And of course, if you are an obese child, the chances of becoming an obese adult are increased. So that's why we try to focus with young children to make a difference in their BMI. Let's go back to that term BMI. You know, what is it and how is it measured? It stands for body mass index and it's their weight and height. You do a calculation on that. Our goal is to decrease BMIs for children because the long-term consequences of a high BMI are things like heart disease, diabetes, high cholesterol, which have long-term implications for health. So if we can make a difference in the lifestyle activities, in what children are eating, um, then we can change that BMI. We have um, a lot of classroom education, a lot of personal one-on-one -on -one education, bulletin boards, uh, interactional TV that they have in the schools. Our nurses do a lot of education through that. And then we have the food museum that we do for all second graders, which has five different components to it and talks about foods that have high fat content, why it's important to have less fat in your diet, um, the importance of grains, the importance of breakfast, the importance of physical activity. Um, we've uh, also increased activities for younger children. We have a first grade program, kindergarten program, even down into pre-K now. But Sims is very excited that they're going to be able to show children how healthy foods are grown, that they will actually be able to serve these children these better, uh, a little more nutritious foods that they're growing. But uh, they're very excited about it at Sims and hoping that it will have an impact on what children are eating. We are doing a garden program to uh, teach the children the values of fresh fruits and vegetables and we're working with um, people in the community on the health solutions team to help bring the community together to help these children learn about fresh fruits and vegetables from the ground up so to speak and um, how vegetables just don't come out of a can, they come and grow. We've got um, collard greens growing here and the kids are real excited, their plants are growing and we're getting ready to transplant them. Sarah Bossa from Mana Food Bank has partnered with us and she is teaching the children how to uh, recycle food that normally would go in the garbage and in our landfills to help make our gardens more, the soil more nutrient with the um, things we can compost. So they made posters of what you can compost, what you can't compost and they're going to separate it out and we've got compost bins going. They're going to go on the, the bins in the cafeteria. We have the cafeteria staff working with us, too, to help the children separate it. We've got the fourth graders are going to be compost patrols that they will make sure that the right foods and things go into um, the, each bin. Some dairy foods can't go in, so they'll make sure everything gets separated out. And then the children have planted just from seeds, collard greens, mustard greens, and this actually is a variety of salad mix that we're planting. So they planted one seed in each pocket and they're gonna watch them grow into a plant. 
the seedlings um, are coming from the Florida Extension Service. They're donating some seedlings. Uh, Mana Food Bank has been tremendous in, in volunteering time and effort in, in these um, building of the, the beds and all the knowledge and all the education she's doing with that. We're hoping that we'll be a pilot program and other schools can come and learn from us. We've got Bellevue Middle School students are going to come over and talk about their garden that they already have and sort of team up with our children but to show them that they can grow they can grow their own fruits and vegetables anywhere whether they have a yard whether they have pots that they can put out on the sidewalk or, or outside of their apartments anyone can grow fruits and vegetables that children can learn in a garden and they can learn all of the things that we're testing in the schools all of our educational um, resources that are being uh, donated to us or, or partners with the health department all will meet the Florida State standards so that the kids can actually have fun growing a garden and, and learn along with that. So um, it makes learning fun. We are working very hard at it. It's going to be a slow process because we didn't get here overnight. It's going to take us probably a full generation. But if we get children thinking about what they're eating, how active they are, we really hope that by the time they become the adults, they will make better choices. Well, once again, Dr. Lanza, um, great program. Uh, we're blessed to be able to have nurses in the schools, right? Right. We have. And tell us about that program. We uh, about three years ago, um, I, I decided with my staff's recommendation um, to have a, on our end registered nurse in every public school in Scambia County, as well as a health support tech. We're the only county in the state of Florida that has that. And their, their main mission, um, the, the nurse is there for health education, provide programs. It's not there to, to patch boo-boos. That's what the health support tech is there for, to, to do that. We uh, do disease surveillance, and we're starting doing these kind of programs. Uh, the first elementary school, and we hope to get what I call victory gardens, victory over obesity, <laughs> victory for healthy lifestyles and, and foods um, in all of our elementary schools. Because I, as a pediatrician, I, you start young, and that carries on to later years. I heard a presentation recently that um, because of this obesity in children, um, you know, today's children may not live as long as their parents, and that's, right. that's pretty shocking. And, and so, um, you know, how can we reduce the rate of obesity in, in children in our area? We, we've got some examples there, but, um, you know, what, what is it really going to take, um, you know, from the family support point of view, from these kids, all that? To, to really make well, it happen. It, it, it's the community, the village sort of concept. We're all mm -hmm. part of that village. It's going to take everyone's buy-in uh, to do that. And, and one of the, the ways that uh, we're looking at it is through something called Unite Scambia, and it's five uh, solution teams, including the health solutions team, of which Robin Herr, who's our, our chair, is in our audience right now. Well, let's go to Robin. Robin, why don't you stand <laughs> up? Uh, Robin uh, has really got the task of... Um, taking the 30% figure that you heard and bringing that down to 20%. And uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that, Robin, and what y'all are doing? Well, you've already heard about the gardens. And uh, we've got uh, a lot of activity going on with the school system, with uh, parks and recreation, uh, all aimed at two things, uh, nutrition and school gardens are part of that, and then exercise and all the things that are attendant to that, making certain that uh, we're getting kids off the sofa, uh, out from in front of the computer screen, and uh, out playing and enjoying themselves. So there's a lot of things that, uh, that are underway, but I think the, uh, the idea of the school garden is, is perhaps uh, sort of our signature statement at the moment because of what we think of in terms of its potential. So what's the timeline of, of reducing it from 30% to 20%? Well, we're aiming to uh, do that by the year 2020. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for being with us, Robin. Thank you. Appreciate you coming out. <laughs> well, activity certainly is something that uh, is going to help with uh, childhood obesity. And we have with us um, Butch, of course, and, and you're uh, involved every day. You're a certified member of the American College of Sports Medicine and deal with exercise daily. Now, how much exercise does it take to stay healthy? Well, first I'd like to address the fact that Michelle Obama came out today kicking off an initiative on children obesity, child obesity. And I would also like to add that in addition to ch uh, child obesity, we're also seeing um, uh, a child onset diabetes as well. So, um, but exercise and physical activity is very, very important. And 
I wish there were more opportunities in the schools, elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools to provide quality physical education programs in the schools. Uh, All right, let's back off of the kids. Let's, let's take a 55-year-old <laughs> man. And, um, you know, he's overweight, uh, pretty good amount overweight, and he starts exercising. You know, what, what's a good, good program for him initially? Well, my first recommendation is to seek a, a doctor's approval, get a, a medical clearance. 55 years old, he may be a prime candidate for heart, heart disease. So my first initial uh, recommendation would be uh, get a medical examination and you know, look at some of his risk factors and go from there and prescribe uh, an exercise prescription specifically tailored to his needs and his desires and so forth. But uh, walking would be ideal for, for a person like this. Uh, we, right. And we recommend at least 20, 30, 40 minutes of cardio um, three, to, three to five times per week. All right, so we got a, you, you, it's a life uh, center, so you know, what does life stand for, L-I-F-E? Well, PJC <laughs> has a wonderful life center, mm -hmm. and the acronym LIFE um, uh, translates into Lifestyle Improvement Fitness Education Center. So that's our mission. Our mission is to try to um, uh, bring more awareness to our students and our community about the lifestyle habits and behaviors. As it was mentioned earlier about uh, many of these chronic conditions can be prevented if only people were held more accountable for their lifestyle habits and behaviors. Now, um, every time you send out an email, he's got tagged on there, exercise is medicine. That's my mantra. <laughs> Exer so, exercise so, so is medicine. Tell, tell me more. What, what does that mean to you? What, I mean, what are you, what are you trying to get at there? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to instill the importance of regular physical activity. I mean, there are hundreds of benefits to physical activity. It, it, it reduces uh, blood pressure. It controls uh, body weight, improves body composition. I mean, there are hundreds of benefits. So um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to encourage all Americans, uh, the staff at PJC, the students, about the importance of regular physical activity. I also would like to say that it's not a fix-all, it's not a cure-all, but it does help to improve the quality of life in people. Well, that, that's great. And, and once again, uh, it, it's, it, everybody asks the question, you know, how much exercise, how much exercise? And uh, you've got uh, what you recommend once again? About, 30, th about 20 to 30 minutes mm -hmm. of daily regular physical activity. Um, and also include a program of resistance training, meaning working with weights. Okay. All right. Uh, I've got a situation here. I'm just going to kind of throw it out. Um, uh, in 2009, uh, 59 year old man weighs 210 pounds he's five feet seven and so when you go over to that BMI thing you know he's off the charts you know he, he it's looking pretty bad for him so he loses um, 30 pounds and uh, goes back and sees his primary care for doctor and you know gets the blood test the lipid profile done and man it, it, it looks great his triglycerides have dropped dramatically his HDL is up his LDL is down and his total cholesterol is down too um, Dr. Snyder, now is that just science, the fact that when someone loses 30 pounds, all of a sudden they immediately see that, that inside benefit? In other words, it's better for their bodies. Well, the, the question, Bill, is so all-encompassing. I think I'll just answer one part of it, and that is that any component is not the answer. So I love the answer of exercise being great, because it is great. But if this gentleman just exercised and lost his weight, if you followed him for three years, if you took 100 of them who lost weight, 94 would gain that weight back in three years. So it's not just exercise. Well, it must have been the appetite program then. He must have been on a wonderful regimen. Jenny Craig, who knows, Weight Watchers, some of them are fabulous. Same statistics, 94% gain their weight back. Your question is, hey, will just weight loss, will being whatever that magic word healthy is, will it help to take care of certain blood parameters that we're used to watching? And the answer is, yeah, they will for a while. But what we're really trying to create here is just what John mentioned. It is a structure of community. It's not the doctor teaching the patient. That's what the word doctor means, by the way. It means teacher. It's not the mother teaching the child. It's a community responsibility. It's really a cultural change. 
that we all have to instill. When should you start instilling wellness in somebody? I'll answer it for you, Bill. You don't have to answer it. You don't have to answer it. <laughs> so the answer is, in utero, start when they're in the womb. We talk to mom about healthy lifestyle for their child then. When dad comes home and wants to go work out, bring your daughter, like mine, up there to work out with you. Why? Because workout's the answer? No, it becomes part of her lifestyle, along with eating carrots. That's her treat at school, and my daughter, her carrots. Next to her is a young fellow that she happens to be madly in love with who's eating ho-hos. <laughs> right? Now, how do you fight that? You don't fight it. You say you're responsible for your own lifestyle. We want to make you healthy. And then you need to expand it. What do I think all of this should start? Just as John said, it needs to start in schools. It needs to start at home, really and truly at home. You can have the best weight loss program for obesity that is the climbing statistic in the United States. 60% of children in the United States, 60% of them overweight to obese. We adopted a little girl from China. In China, fat boys that are now becoming fat over in China because of Kentucky Fried Chicken, no offense, <laughs> sue me if you want, any of those fast foods, all right? Do you know what they're called? They're called ABCs, American-bodied Chinese. Mm -hmm. That's the slur. So we are an overweight population, and the treatment is individual, family, get churches involved, get schools involved. It has to be a whole cultural paradigm shift, not a pill, All not right, a treadmill. Let's get our audience involved. This is another question. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they didn't sign the question, but I'm going to read it. And it says, um, how do I really keep weight off? And Anybody can, can tackle this thing. It, it seems that I lose, I gain, I lose, I gain. I lose, I gain. And I know it's bad to keep the weight on, and so I take it off. But, I mean, is this, is this having an impact on their body, that this yo-yo effect back and forth, back and forth? Of back course and it does. Okay. In fact, the yo-yo the dieting has been one of the worst things that we've seen. That, that has a more negative effect than maintaining a little bit of a body weight higher than you should be. So that up and down, up and down doesn't work. What people have to understand about obesity and, and lifestyle changes it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. You know, it's got to be long-term to count for anything at all. And so when you, when you approach it saying, okay, you know, I'm going to starve myself. I'm really going to cut back and do something for two months here, and I'm going to drop 20 pounds, and I'm going to do something great. You wouldn't do that with high blood pressure. You wouldn't go with high blood pressure and say, okay, I'm going to treat it for two months. I'm going to take my medicine. I'm going to do all the right stuff, and then I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to slip back into my old lifestyle. So it's really got to be long-term permanent changes. It's got to be sustainable changes. You're exactly right. Short-term diets, short-term changes don't work. So you have to incorporate this permanently, you know, the rest of your life. I have patients that I admire. I have friends that I admire that are on up in age that you see these 70, 80, 90-year-old people that have been able to maintain that lifestyle, and it reflects in their, their health. I mean, they're, they're in great health. They're an inspiration to see because they've incorporated that and they've maintained it. So it's got to be not a short-term thing. It's got to be continuous to, to have an effect. All right, Dr. Snyder, um, how did your, your program is, um, is the Florida Health Span Institute, okay? And it, it deals with yes. anti-aging. Well, uh, wait, 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 wait. Now, no, I no, no, wait. I, I, wanna, I wanna make sure I get this introduction right. You, you're, you're board certified in, in four different specialties. Correct. It's family medicine, uh, ear, nose, and throat, uh, pain management, and, and now anti-aging. And I'm a heck you know, of a bowler. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did you become interested in this anti-aging at this point in your life? Well, I became interested because I suddenly became the patient, not the doctor. So when I talk to large groups, I say to them, I want to get a feel for where your concept of wellness is, because I don't know what wellness is. Uh, I know what I think it is for me. So where are we wellness-wise? So let me have you raise your hand out in the audience. Raise your hand if you've been 100 pounds overweight. How about high cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes, insulin? Have you lost your kidneys to diabetes? Ever had cancer? How about a perforated bowel? How about four months or more in an ICU? How about a heart attack? How about bypass? Hmm. How about those new things? What do they call them, Steve? Stents. Stents. Yeah, I get forgetful <laughs> on those things. Stents. One, two, three, four, five or more stents. Raise your hand. Well, let's stop because it's getting boring. How many of you out there have had all of those and you're still alive? Let me see some hand. One, one person's got to have a hand. They're still alive with all of those? Yeah, one person. 
Who's that? One person. <laughs> this is not a Mensa quiz. It's me. <laughs> so that's my health history. And that's what happened. And, and where I was lucky enough to get with uh, another physician at Scripps, and we developed a concept of what we thought was wellness back then in 1994, and it's progressed. So for me, it's not a practice. For me, this is a way of life, and it has to be simple. And there is so much out there right now that's commercialized that I think that the American public is, it, to their own uh, benefit, really, they're wary. What's the right answer? Where's the truth? That's the big question, where's the truth? And the answers have to be simple. What diet is right? You, you know what I live with? A simple phrase. I, I don't know if anybody can agree with this, I love food. You love food, Bill? Always. I love it. L-O-V-E. Throw another E on at the end, love-E. <laughs> love, L, what's the L? Eat a little bit. You want little disease? Make little plates. Eat little, O, eat often four or five times a day, snack, V, sorry, vegetables are good. Eat mostly vegetables. E, eat early in the morning. Eat like a king for breakfast, mm. a pauper for lunch, and a beggar at nighttime. It works. What's the last E? The last E is eat food. Well, what else would you eat? <laughs> well, if you go with me to one of the stores around here and, and you pick up a box of Ho-Ho's, the first ingredient is something I can't pronounce, and I took organic chemistry. I don't know what the heck it is. Mono, diphosphate, glutamate. If it's not in your cabinets, ladies and gentlemen, don't eat it. What's on the bag of carrots? Uh, carrots. That's what's in there. How about celery? Celery. So it's not as complicated as it's being presented. It's being presented that way so a pill will work for you, a plan will work for you. And, and it's more of a symphony. It's just like everybody's been saying. Bioidentical hormones are important. An appetite program that's sane. Longevity principles. If you're still smoking, it's 2010, hello, <laughs> all right? Don't talk about wellness. You need, a, you need an appetite program, activity program. Nutraceuticals, which ones work? Cognitive, you gotta keep your brain going. It's most important. And the last one in balance, E. You've gotta enjoy life. It's a dance. So do I ever have a, a donut? You betcha. I just don't have one every day or every week. Maybe once a month. So you gotta dance, enjoy life. So uh, you've often referred to anti-aging as anti-olding. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a, a concept, because when we get older, we just, we wanna be able to be healthy, we wanna be able to enjoy those years and, and not have yeah. lingering chronic problems. And, uh, and that's, that's what Exactly, what I you wish I, you know, keeping you alive longer is above my pay grade. <laughs> Sorry, it's your job. <laughs> you know, I don't have that. My job is to keep you from olding, from waking up in the morning and saying, Martha, where are my teeth? You know, th that olding process of finding yourself halfway up the stairs and saying, was I going up or was I going down? <laughs> that, those are the kinds of lifestyle changes we want to minimize. All right, I'm sorry I've got to throw this out there, but Dr. Neal, uh, one of the things that people fear most is having a stroke. I, I talk to people all the time, and they say, if I had to have any medical problem, the stroke would probably be the one that I would fear the most. Um, uh, Dr. Willis mentioned tests. If, if someone has had a family stroke, are there tests to determine if someone is likely to have a stroke, and what are those tests? Well, I unfortunately see way too many, and um, as has been mentioned, uh, there's a number of risk factors that are involved with all these things we're talking about. And uh, just basic risk factor control, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, smoking, uh, control of uh, a rhythm called atrial fibrillation. Those are things that uh, working with primary care physicians, other physicians to control are mm -hmm. the most important. There's some basic screening tests once you get into certain ages, such as the 50s or 60s, such as carotid ultrasound, basic ultrasound of the heart that may be helpful as well. But uh, I can't stress enough that control of those risk factors are the most important thing. Let's go over those one more time. The, the major risk factors that would cause a stroke. High blood pressure is number one, two, and three. So uh, <laughs> that's got to be focused on the most. Uh, they've done studies that even a slight decrease in the systolic blood pressure by five, eight points can prevent a stroke 
a certain per percentage per year. Uh, diabetes is uh, also a no-brainer. Uh, all these uh, type of medical issues uh, will uh, cause vascular disease and, and, and obviously control those are important. High cholesterol also goes hand in hand with the others. Uh, atrial fibrillation is a particular heart rhythm that there's particular type of medical therapies that are important to be on uh, to prevent strokes in that area. And then of course, smoking. Smoking it is, always. Um, I was reading, uh, there's, there's something now that, that, that seems to be in, in the internet, you know, everybody goes to the internet, but uh, an increase in the level of inflammation measured by C-reactive protein and an elevated risk to vascular disease. Is that something now that's starting to be talked about, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Yeah, Hill? it's a lot more uh, popular in the uh, cardiac uh, mm -hmm. area. We don't follow it so much for stroke. We mm -hmm. do know that if you check, uh, particularly in a young person, and you see elevated CRPs or sedimentation rates, and you can't find other causes, that that may be something to focus on, and even more aggressive control of the risk factors um, of diet, those type of things you, you want to be more aggressive about. They used to call the Southeast the stroke belt, and uh, are we seeing more strokes just all across the U.S.? Uh, are the numbers higher than they've been? Uh, they are. They've, they grow every year, and in particular the things that have been mentioned already, younger people uh, developing risk factors uh, at a younger age, becoming more obese at a younger age, playing on the computer maybe as opposed to doing sports and being more active. So uh, we're finding younger people having much more aggressive risk factors that, um, that maybe weren't controlled earlier because of whether it be education or whether it be resources or, or all the above. Well, I think we would all like to age with healthy bones and joints. Wouldn't that be something we'd all want? Take your money. Butch, especially you. <laughs> well, you know, I, I love the, the, the modern medicine technology. I, I'm a product of a double hip replacement three and a half years ago, and it's changed my entire life. Before that, I was in severe pain, and my quality of life was going down the tubes, and after having the hip replacements, I'm back to my original active self again. So... Well, I had a chance to meet with Chad Gilliland, and he's out at the Andrews Institute to discuss some of the work they're doing out there in the area of prevention. So what we're going to do now is to roll this tape and uh, get a feel for what's going on out at the Andrews Institute. So let's, let's take a look. It has two primary goals. One is prevention of injury in youth sports. It really hurts us to see the number of injuries that are in youth today that are preventable. You know, there's a lot of injuries in sports, and we encourage kids to play all types of sports. We don't want to ever hold anyone back. That's one rec reputation we have with coaches. They know if they send their kid to us, then we're going to do everything in our power to get that, that young person back safely playing and participating in sports if they want to. Secondly, uh, is military readiness. You know, and, and those two, believe it or not, go hand in hand. A lot of the type of uh, care and prevention work we do in injury prevention in youth also relays nicely to the military uh, worker. And then that military worker also relays very nicely to the first responder in, in multiple uh, active populations, uh, occupational populations out in the world. But those two tend to drive us from, we're very passionate about injury prevention in youth. We have a, a physicals that we do annually. We do a little over 2,400 physicals in our community uh, every spring and fall. And what we're trying to address there is identify a baseline and identify where those athletes could potentially be at a higher risk for injury and either educate them or have a, an immediate impact with some type of training or procedural uh, program to, to address that, that risk and reduce that risk overall. Through that, we, one of the most important pieces we look at is the heart. Even though we're an orthopedic environment uh, with Baptist Healthcare, we've been doing uh, echocardiograms since 1998 on student athletes in our region. And what we're looking at there is to clearly identify the typical um, heart-related abnormalities that cause sudden death in athletes. And if we can do that, save one, you know, we're, we're doing a great service to our community. We look at both the occupational hazards of, of, say, one study we've done recently was on firefighters. And we looked at the firefighter, what their activities typically uh, are, are related to multiple other first responder type individuals. We had tested and looked at what are the common injuries in firefighters, you know, wh where are they getting hurt, and, and then what we wanted to figure out is why. You know, take them some, through some of those stressful movements. And then we identified by watching them work, you know, what type of activities they may have to be faced with on a daily basis. 
and just like with ergonomics, you can train people on how to lift and proper techniques and that type of thing. But when they're in the, you know, in the fire, so to speak, um, you know, they typically that that goes out the window. And it's how your body's prepared to handle that stress. It doesn't always lift in you know planar movements at that moment. We we have to prepare their body for that odd movement, for that odd stress that they may occur in the in the heat of battle. We've got a huge population. Uh, that was born between 1946 and 64 called the baby boomers right. and they're going to start hitting their I guess orthopedic problems pretty soon you know what are y'all doing in that arena to try to help people prevent um, some of the joint and um, bone injuries that, that occur? The kind of more recent concept with that age group is what we call joint preservation what we're looking there is to try to identify you know a lot of people at that age group already have some type of previous injury some type of Previous, previous onset of, of maybe arthritis, you know, just the early beginnings of that. And we're looking at both pharmaceutical um, methods as well as maybe some surgical treatments, minimally invasive sur surgical treatments that will help, you know, pro prolong their joint health and, uh, and trying to identify, okay, if we impact this pa patient or, or client with a, a training program, maybe it's flexibility related, maybe it's strength and conditioning related, can we prolong their joint health, you know, in a proper way? Um, that's real important to us. You know, that leads to higher activity levels in people, less obesity, you know, less heart disease. All those, all those are interrelated when you think of joint health. Uh, bone and joint health definitely uh, start a cycle a lot of times that if it's negative, it, it affects the rest of the body very quickly. I think with uh, in the area of prevention, the thing I'm most proud of is, is how our, our community responds to when we tell them, you know, what could keep them safe. And so whatever the motivation for different environments of folks, you know, we, we try to attack it from that side and to impact the preventive aspects of what they're doing the most. And then with the general population, prevention comes in the way of people just like to you know, do certain things with their life. They may be a runner, they may be, you know, a cyclist, they may be a tennis player or a golfer. And whenever you're doing that activity you love and it's not comfortable, then, you know, that's when people typically look for, you know, adaptations or training environments that help them. We've developed programs here that address each one of those. We address the needs and the desires of the, of the individual, whether you're a high-level athlete or a weekend warrior, and then we try to make sure that you can do your Thing you love the most, the sports you love, or the activity you love with less pain or no pain, hopefully, um, and keep doing that for a long time. Dr. Paulus, a lot of people have heard of the Andrews Institute, but um, there's also, uh, you're the medical director of the Andrews Paulus Research and Education Institute. That's just, that's a part of the overall Andrews Institute. Uh, You've worked with athletes. Certainly, you're an orthopedic surgeon. You, you still perform surgeries today and that type of thing. You've worked at the high school, the college, and, and the professional level, even with the Cincinnati Bengals and the Cincinnati Reds baseball team and all that. Um, th this whole idea of injury prevention in athletes, why is that so important and, a, and, and really a mission of, of y'all's uh, uh, institute out there? Well, I, obviously, our roots are with athletic events and athletic teams, but whatever transpires on the athletic field you can translate into everyday life for the average citizen and uh, as our motto says it's for the athlete and everyone and a lot of the advancements in medicine at least in orthopedics in the last 20 years uh, have benefited the entire population arthroscopic or minimally invasive surgery uh, a cartilage transplant joint replacement joint partial joint replacements these, uh, a lot of this type of work came out of the sports medicine orthopedic er arena and has spread into the general orthopedic population. And uh, thus, uh, so much of what we do in sports applies to the, to the average citizen that uh, much of our research will do the same. And indeed, the, the Andrews Paulus Research Institute is just for that reason. Uh, the, firemen, the firefighters study, uh, the wounded warriors that uh, Chad referenced, uh, the government now understands that if they can treat a wounded soldier like we do our wounded professional athlete that, and get him back into the military, not just let him become a veteran, uh, it uh, does a world of good for his esteem, but also all that money that the government just invested, invested in that individual uh, comes back in, in uh, spades. So uh, all of these 
magical surgical procedures really do translate to the general public. And, and back to the prevention of the firefighters, it was um, a research projects they all did where you looked like the firefighters were all hooked up to all of this equipment and they were going through typical uh, movements that they do, you know, pulling ropes and you know, hitting sledgehammers and things like that and uh, back problems, I guess, uh, muscle problems, all, all the things that, that cause problems. Uh, is it to teach them better ways that, that when they finally get into the fire, you know, they're, they're cognizant of the fact that they've got to also watch that back and make sure they don't, you know, do something irregular? Without a doubt. Uh, it teaches that what we look at is their movements mm -hmm. and in our therapy and our training becomes movement oriented instead of the old traditional way well let's bench press a lot of weight and let's see if I can out bench press you and let's do lots of leg extensions what we find is is that we're far, we're far better off giving athletes and firemen and or soldiers uh, specific tasks to do whether it's chopping whether it's pulling uh, spinning with weights and so it's it's a more functional approach to training, which then translates to learned behaviors so that the body memorizes those movements so that in the time of a fire, uh, those movements are patterned and they prevent injury. Uh, that and the preparation of those body parts to do that movement. And so that's where a lot of that research comes into play. And all that equipment you saw attached to the firemen uh, were EMG, EMG electrodes so we can see when, fire, when certain muscles will fire, uh, no pun intended, and, and, and ignite certain muscle movement and joint movement. And then we time our, our uh, rehabilitation process through that. And, and finally, uh, there was some discussion about uh, joint preservation. And, and of course, Butch, you've um, gone ahead and, and had the, the replacement. Uh, but, but there are people, um, and I'm specifically talking about the baby boomers, the people born between 46 and 64, that are really starting to hit, you know, it may be osteoarthritis, it may, whatever, but, but can you prolong the joint that's there before maybe you have to replace it with, with some, some techniques and what are you doing to prevent the need for the replacement immediately? Without a doubt. I think that the joint preservation concept uh, is one that we've really popularized at, at the Andrews Institute. In fact, we have the first uh, orthopedic trained fellowship in the country titled, entitled just that amount, just that. Rather than replace joints, we want to preserve joints, or at least portions thereof, because once you've had your joint replaced, if anything goes wrong, hopefully not, mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot of escape routes from that, and the, and the second surgery after that's not a fun one. So the idea is to always keep the joint replacement as your last resort, and, and do things to help pre uh, preserve portions of the joint. Well, it begins early on. Don't have that athletic injury that's on the field, and right now we're doing a lot to prevent athletic injuries in the female athlete. The female athletic knee injuries are almost uh, endemic now to, to basketball and volleyball and soccer because the female body is built a little different. The way they land, the way they use their muscles are all significantly different than males. So we've shown that by te teaching female athletes how to land, how to jump, strengthening them in different ways, we can reduce their injuries to the same level as males uh, because right now it's three to four times higher. And, and if someone has that joint injury, then later in life, they're, they're, they're going to be sedentary. They're going to then have high blood pressure. They're going to be heavy. And it's not unusual for someone to come in to us and, and say, look, I'm, I know I'm 100 pounds overweight, but I can't exercise. My knees hurt too bad. Well, it's, you know, so we have to make a deal with them. We do the pinky thing, and we say, okay, if we get your knee feeling better, will you start exercising? And we're serious about that with our patients. And, and indeed, it usually happens that way. And, and like Tom said, uh, it, it's, it's really a, a journey, not a destination that we're in. And, and so we want to teach people how to eat properly, not diet. We want to teach people how to exercise and make it part of their daily life so it's not a regimen or a punishment like many of us grew up. You've got to do 100 push-ups for doing what you just did. Well, that's a punishment. And so I'm trying to make it more of a lifestyle change. Well, great work y'all are doing out there. And uh, Patsy, it's your turn. And uh, you've been sitting over there kind of... I guess waiting for the, the, the big one, and that's smoking. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, you were the uh, regional executive director of the American Lung Association, and um, now you're a volunteer, and they got you to be president, you mm -hmm. know, of the regional lung association, but you're, you're teaching uh, classes out at the uh, University of West Florida. But in all that experience with the American Lung Association, all of the stuff that's, you know, repeated time and time again, uh, we still have people smoking. The, the rates have declined a little, right? I mean, 
They have. Well, the good news is over uh, since the, since the 60s, since the mid 60s, uh, smoking rates were about 42 percent, and so there's been a steady and gradual decline, which is good to about 22 percent. But 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 how how do you see? I mean, it's the same thing with the yo-yo diet. Do people you know take the smoking cessation courses? Bam. Then they you know six months later they're smoking again. Do you, do you find that you've got a course out there that that really works that can really help people stop smoking? Well, the, um, the average time, number of times to try to quit is uh, between five and seven. Huh. So if you, it, the motto is, you know, if at first you don't succeed, quit, quit again. <laughs> so you have to keep trying uh, because it's, a, it's an addiction. And, um, you know, there's a couple things to look at is, is why, if people are smoking right now, why are they not quitting? With everything that we know, why don't they quit? And the short answer is because they're addicted. The, the nicotine um, chemical that's in, in the cigarettes is, is so highly, addi highly addictive that it's, it's very, very difficult for them to quit. If you talk to any ex-smokers, they'll say, uh, usually say it is the hardest thing that they have ever done in their life, and they miss it every day. Um, so that's, that's very powerful. Um, but what has been shown to be the, the most effective is a combination of uh, a behavior-based program because you want to deal with the, the physiological part of getting the nicotine out of your body, um, and that's one component of it. But then you have to deal with the behavior uh, afterwards. But the, the best combination is actually uh, pharmacological uh, aids, so any of the nicotine or non-nicotine replacement therapies combined with a behavior-based program. Do you find there's uh, more reimbursement with smoking than, than other prevention issues? I mean, are there, is there reimbursement through insurance companies for smoking cessation programs? Um, it's, it, it's increasing. It's increasing, but not as much as you would think. I mean, for it to be, a, a, you know, one of the biggest preventable causes of, of disease, it, it should be just across the board, and, and it is becoming more so. All right, we've got a question. Uh, Pamela, is it Cannon? Okay, uh, please stand up. And um, you've got a question about insurance, and um, go ahead and ask your question, please. Oh, I was just wondering if you needed like eye and ear exams, uh, where would you get that if you didn't have any insurance and what would the cost be? Okay. All right. So um, eh, a little insurance question, but uh, we, we talked a lot about that. Um, Dr. Lanza, you want to maybe start with um, eyes or hearing? Well, is there, I, are there programs out there? Part of a, a regular physical exam for an adult mm -hmm. or a child would be to look at eyes and, and hearing. So uh, I would make an appointment with your physician if you, if you had one. If you didn't, then there are a number of clinics that are available, Scammy Community Clinics, a couple of free clinics, St. Joe's, uh, Good Samaritan over in Santa Rosa, uh, Baptist Health and Hope up on Kempstrand, um, or work out a plan with a physician um, to uh, to get a physical exam, and if there was a specific problem with the eyes, or the ears, or anything else, um, that physician can then refer that individual to the We Care program uh, that has specialists that provide care. Uh, this We Care program is uh, was founded by the Scammy County Medical Society Foundation. It's it's administered by the Scammy County Health Department. Been around for 18 years, and last year we had about 6.8 million dollars in contributed services from physicians and all the hospitals in our area. All right, well we're uh, on to the insurance kick now, so here we go. Um, my dental insurance pays 100% for routine preventive care. Okay, dental. All right, but on all of the other things I would like to participate in preventive, the health insurance plans don't pay for. So back back to your thing with smoking. Um, we, we spend a lot of money downstream, right, after people get sick, you know, and do we not spend enough money upstream? And I'm just going to throw it out to anybody that maybe has a, a feeling about that maybe there aren't the right priorities in where we spend some of the health care dollars in this, in this country. And that's, without a doubt, one of, at least one of my pet peeves. And, and it, it's, it's where we prioritize our health care compared to uh, war, uh, and other types of endeavors, such as watching the Super Bowl, and, and how important is that health care to us as individuals. And there are certainly some that are without a doubt impoverished and, and we need to help. But then there are others, and I can't help but think a patient I was taking care of in the emergency room a while back uh, that was a Medicaid patient but had $150 keds on, uh, designer clothes, nails done to the max, 
and was on Medicaid. And, 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 and it's just a matter of priorities, I think, in our lifetime. I think our government has a hard time with that. I think all of the people that we call uninsured, how many are truly uninsurable or, or truly poverty stricken to where they can't afford insurance? And so when we talk about a, an eye exam or an ear exam, I don't think there's a physician out there that wouldn't be able to do that for a minimal amount of money to cover his overhead, uh, cover the people that work for him that are working. And, and it's, it's a, that priority that we have to identify. How, how, okay, so we're 14% of the, of the national gross product is health care. Well, guess how much our war effort is? And, and if we can rally to help uh, devastated nations, why can't we rally to help our people that are devastated? And, and so I, I find that uh, sometimes it's the pr priorities of the individual that really are, are, are warped and not so much the ability to find medical care. But what about it, uh, Dr. Snyder? Um, can you take uh, someone in your program and, and help them live a little bit better life with, with some preventive measures than they would have had, I mean, as they age? Absolutely. And that's what it's all about. And the statistics are there uh, on, a, on an evidence-based medicine platform. So it's not mumbo-jumbo. It's not snake oil. It's the real McCoy. However, just as Lonnie said, the mindset in the United States is for the latest computer, not for well health care. And so what's the answer that I would propose? And, and I don't have the answers, but I would say to those listening, it really becomes your own personal responsibility to educate your own children, to take care of yourselves, regardless of what your insurance plan is. And, and that's just the bare fact. What about industry? Industry is learning now that a quality employee, a healthy employee, where health is the emphasis on a daily basis, improves their return on investment. It costs them a fortune to treat their post-myocardial infarction worker as opposed to having an incentive in the office. What's the incentive? They pay less of their premium, uh, the, the individual worker. Uh, the insurance companies will pay less. It will work. It just has to be demanded. Bill? I heard tonight that one of the largest health care providers in California are going to raise their health insurance premiums by 40%. Uh, you know, asking the public to pay 40% increase. Who has that money? Uh, you know, so again, getting back to prevention, I think, is the key to one of the keys to health care reform. Well, we've, we've got to wrap it up, Dr. Willis, so you, you've got the last shot. Well, good, because this is just kind of a real summary. It's really important to, for people not to put off preventative care. You know, I see patients all the time that don't have health insurance coverage for preventative care, but that's a big part of what I do. They might come in for a cold or a hangnail or whatever, but I'm spending time with them talking about their smoking or their, their lifestyles or other changes that we can make. So even if your insurance doesn't cover preventative care, most primary care doctors know how important this is. This is what we spend a lot of our time on. So don't hesitate to come in and, and just whatever the reason you get in the door, whatever the reason we have to put on the insurance slip, you're going to get a good dose of what we believe is important for your lifestyle. So whether insurance covers it or not, come on in because I think most primary care doctors really emphasize this. I want to thank you all so much for being here and talking about preventive medicine. It is very important that, that people really pay attention to it and uh, maybe do f a few of the things that you all have talked about. And if we've got obesity problems, smoking problems, you know, high blood pressure and everything, we've got to do something about that. So thank you all so much for being with us. And thank you for joining us for this town hall meeting on preventive medicine. And we'll see you next time.